Hey, Algebra 1 students. I wanted to finish up the review that we started in class, the slides that we weren't able to get to uh, today in this video. So thanks for stopping by and let's jump back in. So as we were leaving, uh, we were starting to talk about the slides that dealt with domain of functions and range of functions, so inputs and outputs. So let's take a look at this question and, um, and start talking about that. So Diego's club earns money for charity when members of the club perform community service. So for each student who does community service, the club earns $5 and they're allowed a max number of 12 students in the club. The total dollar amount earned is a function of the number of members who perform community service. Okay, there was a lot there, so let's break that down. Let's see what's happening. We have this function statement right here. The amount earned, E, is a function of number of people who perform community service. Remember, this second part is your input. This is what I'm plugging in, and this first guy is my output. That's important. That means I'm getting, I'm putting in number of people, and I'm plugging, I'm getting out how much they earned. So what does a rule look like? Well, let's start coming up with a rule. Obviously, we're going to be E of, let's see, our input is N, number of people. And what happens? How do we make money? Well, we make money for the charity when we when people do community service. And for each person, you get $5. So in terms of each person, we would multiply by five. We've seen ones like that. This is kind of like if you were charging $10 you know, for a ticket, we would take 10 times this. The 12 has to do with how many people there are, not how you're making the money. Okay, so there's our function rule. Is five a possible input? Well, what are the thing, what am I plugging in? I'm plugging in number of members. So let's go back up to what we know about the members. Or we can have up to 12 people. So is five a possible input? Yeah. We could have one person, two people, three people, all the way up to 12. Is 24 a possible output? Well, this is where you kind of have to start plugging in some numbers and seeing what happens. So like if I have one person do community service, they earn $5 because we get $5 for each person. If two people do it, we would have five times two, 10. Three people would be 15. Four people would be 20, five people would be 25. Are you seeing a pattern in your outputs? You should. Five, 10, 15, 20. Yeah, it's going up by multiples of five, right? Because you're multiplying by the number five. So could I get 24 out? No, because 24 isn't a multiple of 25. Okay, so then let's talk about the domain of this function. So what are numbers that I'm allowed to plug in? Well, we said that we know that our, first of all, our domain, the things that we're plugging in is number of people. And we know that the number of people can go from one person up to 12. So I'm going to do one comma two comma three. I'm going to do the dot 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 comma 12 because it'll follow that same pattern. That is one fancy way, set notation, to write that. We can also say that it's all integers from one to 12, right? Integers because I have full people. I can't say like 1.3 people. So that's why I'm having to list them with commas. Remember, this is very different than we did ones, we did one that looked like this, if you remember. We would we sometimes we would do domain and it would go from 1 to 12. Why can I not do that this time? Why can I not just say 1 to 12? Because this would mean we have all the decimals in between, like 1.6, 2.5, 8.772, and we can't. These are people. We can only have actual full people. So that's why we're using integers. Okay, let's talk about the range. Well, when you're doing range, it's easiest um, for some of these, especially ones that have specific values, to start putting what you get. So we said if we had one person, which is our lowest, we'd make $5. Then we made $10 for two people. Then we did 15. Then we did 20. And we did this all the way up to, tw uh, to 12 people. So I do have to figure out how much it would be if that 12, if 12 people did it. So let's see. 12 times $5 each gave me 60. So that means basically I can make up to $60 for this scenario. So there's my range. These are the kind of outputs I can get. Now we could also say this in words because we could say, this is multiples of five, right? Because we're going up by fives, five, 10, from five to 60. So you could also say it like that. Okay. So let's review this just a little bit because this can get confusing for people. So again, when your domains or your inputs are dealing with numbers of people or like items and you can't have partials, right? You cannot be partial. You're just like full ones. You're dealing with 
your domain being like positive integers because you can only have things that are a positive you can't have negative people and they're integers they're full values so here's an example a group has 50 shirts to sell for ten dollars each i could use this equation a of s meaning like maybe the amount that you make selling them of shirts is 10 s because each shirt is going to be ten dollars Okay, the domain for this function, well, the domain is what you're plugging in, which is number of shirts, right? What do we know about the shirts? We know that we have 50 of them. So my domain would go from one to two to three, all the way up to 50, or you could just say positive integers up to 50. You could also say all the in integers from one to 50. That's another way of saying that. How about this one? If a game required between two to 12 players, then you could say that that would, the allowed number of players would be, you could use your set and say two comma three all the way up to 12 or all integers from two to 12, because again, you only want those full values. So if you can't have partials, you need to use the commas and you need, or you need to talk about it as integers. However, sometimes you're working with something like time and time can have partial seconds. So like, take a look at this graph. On this graph, I have time and then the height of something over time. So like, I can have partial things. I can plug in 1.2 or 5.7. And one of the easiest ways to note that is when it's connected. So when my graph is connected the entire time, I can have all the little stuff in between. That's when we write our domain as an interval of time, right? And so we say um, we can use this time we can use the bracket with the comma and the starting and, and final answer. And the way that I did that, if you recall, is I used that like note card method where I would say, OK, if we're doing domain, we're going to take our note card and we're going to look from left to right because the starting on the left would be the lowest. And then we go all the way over to the right. So if I'm looking, if I start left, the first point of my graph is right here. Follow that down to your x-axis because that's your domain and that's zero seconds. And then I'm connected all the way until the very end, follow it down, eight. So that would mean I could plug in, in anything from zero to eight and everything in between. So that's why we write it as an interval. Okay. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have a pot of water um, and it gives us the temperature um, after t minutes um, of the pot of water being on the stove. So this is how the temperature fluctuates. Okay, the graph of the function is shown. Is 250 in the range? So first of all, they're kind of splitting it up because now we're gonna going back to range. Remember that range is talking about y values or outputs. So I'm gonna go to 250 on the y-axis because I'm looking at range. And I'm gonna look across at 250. Does my graph ever hit 250? No, so 250 is not in my range. So then they want us to describe the range. Well, remember, we do, don't, we do range and domain very similar, except for range, I'm gonna get out my note card, but turn it sideways, because range, you start at the bottom and work your way up. Domain, you go left to right. Range, we go bottom to top, so here we go. We look for the first time that our graph, the lowest point on our graph, and the lowest point looks right here. And that Y value is 75. So I'm gonna start at 75, and then I'm gonna go up until it's connected all the way to the highest value, which is right there. Now this one's a little tricky because this is 200, this line is halfway, so that's 225. So I have to go in between 200 and 225. So I'm gonna say like 212, but I'm estimating. So I went from 75, connected all the way up to about 212, it looks like. So I'm gonna use my brackets, and I'm gonna say 75 comma 212, because I can be every little change in partial de uh, decimal temperature in between there, right? Okay. Again, this is an estimate. Okay, let's do the domain. So I'm gonna turn my little note card sideways, and I'm gonna look at it from left to right. So the first place I hit it as I'm moving from left to right is right there, which is, if I follow it down, time equals zero, because we're doing domain. And then it's connected all the way until the end, which if I follow it down is 30. So the domain goes from zero push, all the way to 30. Okay. And then does WT equals zero have a solution? Remember, this is the output. So you're looking for when, if because I'm not plugging something in, I'm getting out of zero. So I'm looking for when the Y value is zero. So here I go over to the Y axis. Here's Y equals zero. It's the X axis. But this is zero. Does this graph ever reach zero? Nope. 
So I would say, no, it does not have a solution. There's never a time. What would it look like if it did? Well, like if your graph, for example, if it went like here and then it went whoop and came down, this right here would be when it's equal to an output of zero. And so I would say whatever that time was, you know, maybe it's 27 seconds or something. Okay. All right, then we switched gears and went to piecewise functions. And I think some of, so a big thing that some people missed with piecewise functions is that this portion of the piecewise function tells you what you're allowed to plug in. It's your domain. So this, this, these statements will tell you where you can plug it in, and then this part tells you what you get out. So like, let's look at this. This is talking about, it says P, is the cost in dollars of mailing a letter um, based on its weight W. So you're gonna get out cost of postage, that's probably why they used a P, and then depending on the weight. So depending on how much it weighs, the postage is gonna have something. Okay, so let's see what they ask us. How much does it cost to send a letter that weighs 1.5 ounces? Well, you have to figure out where 1.5 is allowed to be plugged in. Is it between zero and one? No. Is it between one and two? Yes. So I'm gonna be able to plug in 1.5 1. is gonna be this line. So how much is the postage? You could follow it across. The post postage is just $1.72. So if it's 1. 1.5, it's $1.72. Most of you have seen probably examples of this in the real world. Okay, how much does it cost to send a letter that weighs two ounces? Well, this one's a little trickier. Look at your choices. Why do you think it's trickier? Yeah. Two shows up in two different places. You have two here and you have two here. So the question is, how do I decide where it should go? Well, only one of them has an or equal to sign. That's this one. This one is not allowed to be two. This one is allowed to be equal to two because of that. So two is actually also gonna get plugged into that second line. So two is also $1.72. Okay, now let's just do some more for some fun. So like, what if I said that it weighed, let's try another one. What if I said it weighed 2.65 ounces and you wanna know how much it costs? I would look through, it's not between zero and one, it's not between one and two. Ooh, it fits here. So for this one, it would cost me $2.29. How about if it weighed 3.7 ounces? 3.7, let's see, 3.7 doesn't fit here and it doesn't fit here. So if I was trying to do 3.7, I could not figure this out. I would not be able to get the postage because it's not part of this set of rules. Sometimes that happens, it's outside of your set of rules. Okay, um, the last little piece on this one is what does this look like as a graph? And then we'll try a couple more graphs like this to kind of see. So I'm gonna copy this um, so that I can take it down when I go to graph. So what do piecewise graphs look like again? Um, they look like little pieces of a graph kind of stitched together. So for this one, I'm gonna use the domain to help me graph this. So from zero to one ounces, I am $1.15. So I'm gonna go up to where I think like $1.15 is, which is maybe like here, and that is gonna go from zero to one. So I would just have a flat line because it's the same price from zero to one. Boom, okay. Then from one to two, it jumps up to $1.72. So I'm gonna go to like $1.72-ish, and it's $1.72 from one all the way over to two. I don't know why it put that little point there. I don't want it there. Do that one more time. From one to two, okay. And then it's 229 from two to three. So I'm gonna go up to 229 for my postage. 229 is maybe here-ish. And that's between two and three. So 229 between two and three. And then last but not least, it's 286 from three to 3.5. So 286 maybe is here-ish on the y-axis. And I'm gonna go straight across from three to 3.5. Careful that you don't go all the way to four. Okay, there's only one more thing we need to do, and that has to do with telling the reader whether it's supposed to be equal to or not. Remember, if you are not equal to, you use an open circle, and if you are equal to, you used a closed dot. So, 
for this first interval, I should be an open dot at time at weight equals zero, and then this end will be a closed dot. For the next section, one is not or equal to, so I'm going to have an open dot on that end, but a closed dot here, and then it continues that pattern. Okay. Okay. So now I want to. I'm actually going to pop out of this screen and pop over to a couple of examples I have with this. So. What if I wanted to look at domain and range with piecewise functions? So like, what if I asked you to give me the domain and range of this guy specifically? All right, well, let's start with domain. So the domain for piecewise functions, um, like this one, it looks like it starts at zero. Um, it doesn't include zero, so I'm gonna use um, a parentheses, because we said a parentheses is when it's an open circle. But here's the thing, check this out. So I have everything between zero and one, and then as soon as it goes bigger than one, it's up here, but it's okay, because these, see how these kind of like overlap? Like this one's closed, but that one's open. So you don't have to leave it out. So that means I'm gonna go all the way from here, all the way across, I have all these X values, all the way up until 3.5. So that, oops, and then this end has a closed dot. So that one I'm gonna use, oops, I'm gonna use the bracket. So my domain, again, if I got out my little note card, right? My domains, the first point, the leftmost point is at zero, but because it's an open circle, I used a parentheses. And then everybody is connected. Everybody overlaps all the way through until 3.5. That's the end. And because it's closed, I have a little bracket. Okay. Now, let's talk about range. Range is, is easier in some senses and I guess maybe a little more challenging in some other senses. So I'm going to put domain here. Okay. So for the range, we need to talk about the things that we can get out. And that's why I have the little thing off to the side, because each of these, like this one's very easy to tell what y value that is, and then it jumps up to the next y value, then it jumps up. For these piecewise functions, you're only going to include whatever y value this is, because do you see, they don't have all these little y values in between. So it's only those flat numbers. So what is my range here? Well, my range would be this first one is at a y value of 0.5. So the first thing I would do is list 0.5. I'm going to do a set because I'm just listing numbers. So 0.5 comma, then it jumps up to this. And that's why I put this off to the side. The next one was 0.71. And then it jumped up. It's not connected, but it jumps up to this value, which if I use my little chart was, I guess, 0.92. And then it jumps up to this guy, which if I use my little chart was 1.13. Those were the only possible range values, right? Because they weren't just connected. So what, what I want you to see is that you cannot say, you can't say that this goes from 0.5 all the way up to this one, which was one point. You can't say this, 1.13. Why not? Because this isn't connected. See, there's little open spaces. So I just had to list the exact values. So that's why I listed them separately. I think I might have one more example. Yep. So here's one more example. This one has like age and then it has um, the train fare. Okay, so let's do domain and let's do range. So, all right, we'll start with domain. So I'm gonna get out my little note card and we're gonna start all the way to the left. So there is a little point right here. Okay, so I have this point, and it's a closed point, so that means what x value is this? The x-axis, this is zero, and then it goes, it's connected all the way to here, and then it overlaps, so you're fine, you don't have to stop. Then it keeps going up there, and then it overlaps, so you're fine, and then it keeps going all the way to, what is this x value? 16. So that means my domain is going to go from zero, connected, all the way to 16. So I can use my interval. So I'm gonna say it started at zero, which was a closed circle. What's interesting about 16 though, since it's an open dot, I'm gonna say 16, but I'm gonna use a parentheses because I don't want to include it. If this had been a closed dot, guys, then I would go ahead and make it a, a bracket. Okay. All right, and then let's do range. Once again, because it's only flat values, I'm, um, I'm going to have a set or a list of numbers. So let's see, this particular y value, and you can get out your note card again if you need to. This particular y value 
right here, it is a line, is at y equals, this would be a zero. Then it jumps up to, what's that y value? Follow it over, five, and then it jumps up to $7. So my only range values were zero, five, and $7. That's it because they're not connected. I can't say zero to seven because there's a bunch of missing stuff. So when you have these kind of like stair step functions, guys, like these and these, your range is going to be just a selection of values. So keep that in mind as you're studying. Okay, I'll come back to this other stuff later. All right, let's go back to our slides from class. Okay, so then the last thing that we talked about was um, absolute value. And this is just a word problem with absolute value. So most of you have probably heard of the term elevation. It's used to describe the height of a place. So like I could give the height of a city or a mountain or a valley compared to sea level. So like, here's what I'm talking about. This is what this is considered sea level. It's like the natural water level. So this is sea level. And then you might have a city that is, you know, on like more on a hill and then you could have a valley. So we talk about um, the elevation of a town with respect to how far it is from sea level, okay? And if it's above sea level, it's a positive number. And if it's below sea level, it's a negative number. But if I just want to talk about its general, um, like this particular function that we're going to do then says we just want to give the vertical distance from sea level. So I just want the distance from sea level, which means even if it's negative, I don't want to say like, oh, you're, at, you're negative 100 feet. I want to just say you're 100 feet below. So I'm going to change it to just general distance, meaning positive. So let's fill in this table. So here's what, here's what I mean. So if, you're, if your town was 180 feet positive, that would mean above sea level. That's, that means it's 180 feet from, from sea level. Easy. If you were 12.1, that means you're 12.1 above, but you're still 12.1 from sea level. All the positive stuff stays positive. And if you're zero from sea level, that would have been a zero. The negatives is the one where it changes, right? This would mean I'm, I'm below sea level by 5.4. I don't care about the negative. I would just say like I'm 5.4 from it. Or instead of being negative 36, meaning you're below, you're just going to say I'm 36 feet from sea level. So what do you notice? Every time it's negative, it just becomes the positive version because we're talking about distance, right? So what is a function that represents this? This is what we talked about in class. f of x equals, this is called the absolute value function. And what does that do? That takes whatever you plug in and makes it positive. So if it's already positive, it's going to stay positive. But if it is negative, it becomes its positive version. Okay. So if two towns have different elevations, um, or two towns have different elevations, but they um, both produce an output of 25. How could that be? How could they have two different elevations, but they both get out a 25? Well, one of the towns is probably easy. If it gets out of 25, that's probably because you plugged in 25. What's the other option? What's another number you could plug in to this relationship, this absolute value relationship, and get 25? Yeah, negative 25. So it could also have been negative because that would become positive 25 as well. Okay, so then we talked about, I don't know where my, there my, there's my table. Okay, so then we talked about absolute value graphs, right? Because this is the absolute value function. So this graph that I have over here is y equals absolute value of x. And we said that it looks like a v and it has a vertex at zero, zero. And then we talked about what happens as we shift our graph around by, by adding and subtracting things to our function. Okay. So let's look at what happens if we do things on the inside. So like this one, I'm adding three on the inside. This one, I'm subtracting five. So what happens when I do things on the inside to the graph? You might remember from class, it shifts me left and right. Adding on the inside shifts me left. So, so this is going to shift me uh, left three units. So where's the new vertex? Well, it was at zero, zero. Shifting left moves your x value only, and it's going to shift it to negative three then. So the new vertex would be at negative three, zero, because you went left. Think about it. Going left on my graph would go one, two, three. So my new vertex would be at negative three. So it's kind of like the opposite of what it looks like. It becomes a negative three for the x. 
How about shifting? How about x minus 5 inside? Well, having a minus inside actually shifts you to the right. 5. And shifting to the right would mean that you change your x value to a positive 5. So this would become the vertex would then be at 5, 0. So once again, I want you guys to see this. Shifting left and right. Sorry. Shifting left and right changes the x value of the vertex. Shifting left and right changes the x value of the vertex. And if I wanted to look at that again, if I wanted to see that kind of graphically, I can show you like the first one, for example. If I were doing this, if I shifted the vertex over here, three units, oops, three units to the left, then your graph would look like this. It would be still a V-shaped graph, but your vertex would now be over here. So see, that's like the graph shifted three to the left. So now the new vertex is at negative three. For the second one, I shifted it x minus five. We said shifted it right five. So now you'd have the same exact graph, except the vertex would be at five, zero. So see how that works? So they're just shifting. You're just moving that graph around. Okay, so that's what, happening, that's what happens when you do something on the inside. Oops. So we know what happens when you do something on the inside. So what happens when I do something to the outside, outside of the absolute value symbol? Doing something on the outside shifts you up and down. And the good news is, with this one, you don't have to switch it. So it's, it's exactly what you might think. If I add 6 on the outside, I'm going up 6 units. And it's going to affect my y value, right? So 0, instead of 0, 0, you'd go 6 up in the y direction. So that would become 0, 6. If you subtract, just as you can imagine, it goes down 10 units, which shifts your vertex from 0, 0 to it changes the y value only to negative 10. Okay. So in general, this is important. In general, if you, have, if you take your original function and you start messing with it, if you want to find the vertex, you're going to use those two values. The only thing that happens is because this is kind of like a minus here, you always have to flip the H's sign. You always have to flip the H's sign. So let me do an example. I'll show you what I mean. But that's how you can get the vertex because you can see what happened to the two values. So let's say I had x plus 5 minus 18. Okay. The new vertex would be at, well, x was, instead because I was adding 5 inside, we have to flip it. So it would actually be at negative 5, but the y stays the same. So it would be at negative 18. The new vertex would be at negative 5, negative 18, left 5, down 18. Um, I'll try another one. What if I had x minus 2 plus 3? This would mean the vertex is switch the x, don't switch the y. What happened? I went right 2 because of the minus inside and up 3. Okay, let's try some. So what is the vertex of this, of this absolute value graph? Well, it was 0, 0, but because you did stuff on the inside, you changed the x, and you just have to switch it, so it would be negative 3, but nothing happened on the outside, so it stays 0. So the vertex would be at negative 3, 0. On the second one, we didn't change anything inside, which means your x value would still stay the same, 0. And your y value, remember, you don't switch the y's, so you stay 6. How about when there's both? The x is minus 2, you got to switch it, it's positive 2, and then the y stays positive 7. So now the vertex is at 2, 7. And for the last one, switch the x, negative 15, the y stays the same. So if I asked you to tell me, like, how did it move, like, the, like tell me the moves, on this first one, adding 3 inside went left 3. Adding 6 outside, up 6. This one has 2. The minus 2 inside is right 2, and the 7 on the outside is up 7. This last one, the plus 15 is actually left 15, because it's the opposite, remember, and the minus 8 is down 8. Okay, so those are absolute values. All right, I have one more thing I want to cover. We talked about average rate of change in class, and we talked about it a little in the review, but I wanted to do it from a table because some of you guys had trouble with the table. Um, so let's look at that. So if I find the average rate of change, remember, average rate of change is how much you change vertically 
or between the y values over how much you change horizontally or the change in the x values. And the change just means I'm going to subtract them, kind of. It's one way to think about it. So if I want to do 1992 to 1995, okay, the first thing I would do is I would identify where, oops, I would identify where those two things are on my chart. So here's 92 and here's 95. On top, I need to figure out how much I changed to go from this Y value to that Y value. And all I do when I'm trying to figure out how much it changed by, guys, I'm subtracting. So I'm subtracting the second one from the first. Because look, most of you, some of you could even probably do this without doing the subtraction, but 50,000 to 4,000 is a difference of positive 4,000. It went up by 4,000. Okay. On the bottom, you're going to do how much you changed in years. If you go from 1992 to 1995, that's a difference of how many years? Three. So then I have 4,000 divided by three, and I would use my calculator to get that. So let's see, 4,000 divided by three gave me about, it's a decimal, but that's okay. It's about 1,333.3 people per year because that's it's telling me how much it changed. How do I decide what goes here? It's always the Y stuff per the X stuff because you're putting the Y stuff on top and the X on the bottom. So this is how many people it changed per year. Okay, let's try another one. And you can, you can pause it and try it on your own if you want and then come back. I want the average rate of change from 95 to 1998. Okay, let's go over here. I'm going to get rid of this stuff. So now I'm going from 1995 to 1998. So from here to, whoops, from here to here. Okay, so I have to do the change in Y values. Now, ooh, this one's interesting because this one went down. This one went down by how much? Well, again, it's easiest to take the second value and subtract the first, but some of you might you know, be able to do it without, but that's how you do it. So I'm gonna subtract the second value from the first and see what I get. 3,000 minus 54,000 was a change of negative, right? Because it went down 24,000. So if it went down, you should have, this number should definitely be negative. Over how many years? Well, again, I changed from 1998 to 1995, which, which is a change of three years. Now this number is gonna come out a little nicer. 24,000 divided by three gave me negative 8,000. Remember the Y stuff? which is population, so people per the X units year. So from 1995 to 1998, you lost 8,000 people each year. Who knows why, but we did. Okay, let's do one more and then we'll call it a day. Same thing, again, if you wanna try this, you can hit pause, try it, and then see what the answers are. All right, this one is the weight of an object fluctuates as a function of time. Okay, find the average rate of change from two to 10. So here we go. We're gonna do two to 10. On top, you're gonna to do the difference in the Y values. So how much did the Y values change? It went up by 4.5, because it went from 4.5 to nine. So on top, I'm gonna to have 4.5. Again, how did I get that? I took nine minus 4.5. On bottom, it's the change in your time. So the change in the X values went from two to 10. How much is that? The difference between two and 10 is eight. So then I'm gonna do 4.5 divided by eight, and I get a decimal. Again, that's totally fine. 0.5625. What are my units? Y values are on top, which was pounds per seconds. So that means that this weight is fluctuating 0.56 to about half a pound each second. Okay, let's do average rate of change from 13 to 15. Okay, from 13 to 15, the change in the Y's, ooh, this one's going down. Again, easiest way to do this is take the difference, so subtract these two numbers. So I'm gonna subtract 7.2 and 4.5, and because it's, I got 2.7, but because it's going down, I know it's negative 2.7, so I just subtracted those two numbers. So my Y values went down, negative 2.7. How much did my X values change by? 13 to 15 went up, or positive two, right? What changed by two, okay. So then I'm gonna divide negative in my calculator. I've got negative 2.7 divided by two. I get negative 1.35. Again, my units are Y stuff on top, pounds per X stuff, seconds. So from 
13 to 15 seconds, we were losing 1.35 pounds each second. Okay. You might want to watch those a couple of times to get a good feel for it. Um, definitely go through this. Go back through the ones that we did in class, which are posted, and you can see um, before you do the formative. Good luck with that. It is the end of the unit, so we get to move on after this. So just make sure that you feel good about this stuff, and um, I'll see you in class.